Welcome to Spirit Pig. This is the show that explores how to live a fulfilled life. I'm Duncan CJ and in this episode I talk to Charlie Sharman about how our health and happiness is largely linked with how much exposure to daylight we receive, why our modern lifestyle is causing greater levels of stress, anxiety and sickness, what we can all do to counter this, plus we find out what on earth is a photon pod and how can its cutting edge science and technology improve one's well-being. Coming up right now in Spirit Pig. Enjoy. Hey guys, welcome to Spirit Pig. Um, today we are joined by an awesome guy. Uh, his name is Charlie Sharman, and uh, he is the founder and CEO of Cantifix. And he has been behind the creation of some of the most cutting edge and revolutionary uh, glass structures for the last 28 years. Uh, his latest endeavour, the Photon Project, combines revolutionary scientific research, structural engineering and architectural design and addresses, amongst other things, the link between a person's exposure to daylight and also their overall levels of happiness and well-being. It's received huge, huge media attention, and uh, including that of Reuters, uh, ITN, the Daily Mail, and has caught yeah, the interest of uh, hundreds of thousands of people worldwide. So, Charlie, thank you uh, so much for being here. It's absolutely fantastic talking to you that's okay yeah no it's nice that nice to be on there <laughs> now i saw it was about a month or two ago and i was um i was coming back i was just um going back on the tube and i picked up a, an evening standard which is on the uh, on the chair next to me and this is how i heard about the photon project for the first time there was the picture of some of the uh, the designs on top of a skyscraper um now for anyone who's not obviously sure what Photon Project is. Can you maybe just give us a bit of history, maybe how did it all come about? W what is the Photon Project? Okay, yeah, it's, um, as you say, I've been doing glass buildings for the last 28 years. Um, and actually, I, I was doing a talk uh, at the VLUX on glass buildings and living in glass buildings at the same time as uh, Professor Russell Foster was giving a talk on um, the biology of daylight or the benefits of daylight on human biology. At the end of it, he just said, I don't suppose you could build me a glass building that we could actually live in. Could you? So, Because what they haven't been able to do, they, they've done a lot of testing on education. They've done a lot of testing in, uh, uh, in the sort of um, workplaces. What they haven't done is testing people's homes. Because, of course, it's very difficult. People draw their curtains. People uh, uh, turn on the lights and all sorts of things. So what he wanted was a daylight space. So, of course, for me, that was the easy part. Uh, but actually, it's been a roller coaster ride ever since. I never thought I'd be talking at the uh, uh, Cheltenham Science Festival <laughs> on a stage with a group of eminent neuroscientists as a public <laughs> salesman. But it was fun. And it's been a lot of fun ever since. So, so what is? I mean, I know that um, you just you mentioned um, Dr. Um, Russell. Um, obviously, I think there's there's this four year um, four year project going on when I think they're taking three or four hundred um, candidates and. They're putting them inside of one of your glass structures for three weeks at a time, oh. and they are observing just the. They, they, well, they're observing all sorts of things like stress levels, sleep patterns. Um, is that is that correct? Yeah, I mean it's very simple. You 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 really you test for melatonin because that's what we call our sleep hormone, uh, and you test for cortisol. So they're done from urine and saliva, <clears throat> and then you do a, a fairly simple sort of questionnaire about levels of happiness, levels of sleep. Uh, levels of productivity, those sort of things, and you can assess it very much scientifically on that. But what's fascinating, and uh, I think what's exciting, and 300 participants in a, in a uh, scientific research doesn't actually, to the most people, sound a lot. But they did uh, stat, they did the research on statins for cholesterol, uh, which just I think 40% of the world now take. It was done on 1,400 people, so 300 people in the field research is massive, massive scientific research. So yeah, they'll live in there, they reckon, as little as 17 days, and that'll be enough for them to be able to gauge exactly what the benefits were to their yeah, stress levels, uh, anxiety, uh, performance, energy, libido even, uh, not to mention all the serious effects on medical conditions like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, even some cancers. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing the effect you can have. Can we maybe just... Um for for anyone who's not 100%, um, I think you, for your you had this video which is great. I mean, I, I'll link it up in the um, in the show notes below for um, for your crowd cube, and um, it was talking. It took it back to almost to history. So in the old days, when you know thousands of years ago, 
what you're saying, we, we would be woken up by the sun and that's when melatonin levels would, be, would rise because it was time to wake up, is that correct? And then when the sun set... Uh, that would be great if you were nocturnal. If it's you're actually nocturnal. The it's the other way around. <laughs> luckily, by some amazing coincidence, but maybe not, um, early humans uh, started on the equator. Yeah. Yeah, wonderfully, 12 hours a day, relentlessly follows 12 hours of night. Therefore, it's not surprising that our body clocks were set up on that. And actually, what you just said is the other way around, in that melatonin is <laughs> <I'm> our... dyslexic. <laughs> <laughs> melatonin is our sleep hormone. So okay. what, you, what you need is, in the morning, you need to suppress your melatonin. And that's done from quite a big burst of light. Uh, and this means, and I know there are lots of therapies where you can have light shining in your eyes. And that's fine, as long as you're never further than about 12 inches away. <clears throat> Any further than that, it's, it's actually pretty ineffective. So you're talking about a big burst of light which suppresses your melatonin, tells your body it's now time to wake up. Now from that, other hormones are produced like cortisol, which makes us active. So our day follows a pretty natural path. So if you were a, uh, you were out early human, you're looking for your woolly mammoth to feed your village. It's absolutely classic. You're awake at, at, as the sun rises. You're very, your your blood blood starts to beat. Your blood pressure increases. And actually, you're very well coordinated at round about 10 o'clock when you want to go out there on your, on your mission to find your mammoth. Mm. Round about sort of 2 o'clock, your, your ability, your agility is in, in, enhanced when you're presumably in the process of killing your mammoth. And then round about 5, your, muscular, uh, your muscles are at their strongest when you need to carry uh, the mammoth back to your village. I know I've made it sound very simplistic. Then, of course, the sun goes down. You need your sleep to be able to start the whole process again. So it's a, it's a circadian rhythm, is what they call it, which is completely governed by our evolution. We can't avoid it. And I think the interesting thing is, because when you um, set the scene like that, um, I might be listening to that thinking, okay, that's great, but how does that relate to me? But um, I think the, re the reason that's so interesting is because nowadays, in the 21st century, we often might wake up, our alarm goes off and it's still dark, we go mm. on the underground, we're on the tube, dark, we, uh, we're in a cubicle all day long, and then even when necessary at night time, when it is time to sleep, people on iPads, phones, which is artificial light. And so that is me making our whole body clocks just going completely haywire. Is that correct? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's for everyone to recognize that most people have been through jet lag. And that is yeah. a clear sign when your body clock is out of rhythm with the environmental time. And it sort of makes you feel lethargic and everything's slightly unreal. And you're absolutely not right in what you say. If you... If you wake up in the dark, you go to work in the dark, you sit in, whether it's a cubicle or in an ordinary office environment, which has pretty low levels of light compared to the sun, actually your melatonin is never fully suppressed. So surprise, surprise, you're never fully awake. And as you say, at the opposite end of it, you lie in bed looking at your iPad, worst thing you can do, there's, there's light close to your eyes, and actually your biology is saying, right guys, stay awake, stay awake, I need to be active. So your melatonin is never kicking in, so you never get the proper sleep either. And this is not surprising when well, we all suffer from stress, anxiety. You know, I mean, incidents of schizophrenia are rising, ADHD in children. You know, okay, there are lots of other reasons for all this. I'm not pretending that we can solve it all with a splash of daylight. But actually, if you take your life back to a much more biological, evolutionary beginning, that's a very good start. What can we do about this? Because this is what one of the things you're addressing. I mean, you know, okay, it's... We, we've got higher stress levels, but I've got a nine-to-five job. The office is where it is. I can't do anything about that. What, what can I do listening to this, actually thinking, okay, I want to have less stress. I want to, you know, have higher you know, levels of, you know, happiness. What, what's, some, what's some of the practical things that we can be going out and doing, you know, based on a lot of this scientific research? Because hmm. that's well, interesting, because it all it is all based. This isn't just um, concepts. You know, there's actually a lot, of hist a lot of research and science backing up all these things you're saying, isn't there? Massive amounts of it, yeah. So much you couldn't read in a lifetime. And actually, I'm not a scientist. I must make this clear. <laughs> I've read a lot of science in the last four years, but I'm not a scientist. Um, I mean, the good thing about this is, you know, if, you, if you've got a con an idea to eat differently, cut out carbohydrates, there's always someone who's going to tell you, you know what, that's the wrong thing to do. Mm. In this case, I've never met anyone who said to me, I hate da daylight. I like darkness, quite frankly. Um, so the very simple thing is, your body just needs to be reminded that it's living in a night and a dark situation. So actually, 
as the sun comes up, it doesn't have to be the sun, it can be behind a very dark cloud, but as, as that's happening, why don't you just go out there once or twice a week and just remind your body that actually, in fact, we're controlled by higher things and whether our, our, our monitor's uh, too bright or not. It doesn't actually, um, you're saying it doesn't actually, for your, uh, I, got, I got the phonetic spelling out, <laughs> circadian, is that correct? Circadian, yeah. <laughs> I had to Google that because I was looking at that word for about 10 minutes and I was like, Circa- circadian? For, for, for your circadian um, rhythms, you know, say they're all out of whack, but how, I mean, it only takes, what, three or four days, the same, two or three days, the same amount of time as um, adjusting from a jet lag. You know, that's all you need, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, jet lag is an extreme case. Most people's rhythms aren't as out of whack as that. So, yes, I mean, one, two days. As I say, you just need to remind yourself or your biology, because that's all it is, that actually the sun comes up and the sun goes down, and actually that's a better way of timing our days than what time the alarm clock goes off or what time your favourite television programme's on. It is quite simple, you know, and that's what makes it so, I think, compelling uh, and instinctive to most people. They understand that. It's very, it's very easy. But when we go on holiday, we all feel better. And, OK, it's not necessarily because we're lying on a beach reading a book. It's because we're outdoors, you know, uh, and that is much more of a natural environment, obviously. And uh, like I said, I'm going to put um, I'm going to put the little video in the link below so people can actually see the uh, the graphics and the images. But could you maybe just paint a little picture of us um, to us of exactly what one of these photon pods are like? Because from 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 the surface, it looks like okay, is that it looks like a bit like a greenhouse. But what what's the difference between a photon <laughs> pod and your greenhouse? You might. I'm see not sure I can go on with this interview. You mentioned the greenhouse word. I can't believe it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know it's, it's the it's the forbidden word. <laughs> Uh, I mean, we're not expecting for a minute people to live in all glass houses for lots of reasons. It's not very practical uh, and living in an urban environment, you know, you're, you're intruded on all the time. But if we are going to spend time in it, and, and we're sort of pitching this at people who either, you know, they want one in their garden because they have a particular problem, they do a lot of travel perhaps, um, or for other medical reasons, or in fact, you know, if you're going to stay in a hotel room in a beautiful part of the world, why isn't it made out of glass and you can see what's going on around you? Uh, so we're aware of the fact that people are going to spend time in it, and even if that was only three, four days, it's got to be livable in. The conditions have got to be temperate. So we're using glass that, well, most people would never have seen. So we brought together a whole lot of technologies from all around the world to put into a, a sheet of glass or into a skin of glass. So these things, they control the temperature inside, uh, they control the amount of solar radiation coming in. They cut out all UV light because obviously that would be great to live in a glass house but actually get skin cancer. So none of that comes through. You've got to cut out sound. Um, and then interestingly, people come up with the whole privacy issue. The funny thing is when you're in one of these buildings, you feel you're looking out rather than being looked in at. But understandably, people don't always want to get ready for bed uh, in, in, in public. <laughs> We're not all exhibitionists. <laughs> but actually, they've done a lot of psychological studies on this as well. As long as you don't know the person looking at you, actually, apparently, it doesn't matter. So it's a good argument. We are not exhibitionists. Our neighbors. Like it's the benefit of these talks. I'm learning new things every day. <laughs> so what we've had to introduce, obviously, is um, glass switches. So this switches from clear to opaque. So actually, you can have privacy whenever you like. It also has the benefit that... If you want darkness, which is very difficult to get in this world, you know, unless you happen to be in the middle of nowhere, um, you need to have cut out all that, uh, all that, all the light from outside, all the light pollution. So the the skin of the bedroom, in particular, will go completely down to to opaque, so nothing comes in. So actually, you can also program it to control the particular jet lag you have or the particular medi- medical condition. So it is all glass. This building, and I wish I could show you a picture, because then you can all see what it looks like. But it's all glass, but it's glass that you won't recognise as, uh, as things you see every day. That was amazing. That was amazing. And you, um, I think, so, so the, what, what is, what's the ultimate vision? Because I know you're, you said to start with, the obvious market is the health and wellness market. We've got spas, hotels. Yeah. But h- how far can this, this idea be, be taken? I mean, do you, where, where, where do you see it going? Like, you know, years down the future, like you say we don't, uh, it's not necessarily practical at the moment for people to be living in them, but is this like 50 years, 100 years? Are we going to be in these glass houses? Will, will we all have like woken up to actually the importance of being outside and having much more daylight? Or where can you see this well, going? I think people are waking up to that. 
I mean, I think in 50 years' time, they'll build houses out of wind, probably. I don't know. <laughs> um, but I think, I mean, what, what's important, you know, these days, you look at the way houses are designed, and if you were talking to an architect now, they'd say, you know, we, we form, we make the, the world look the way it is. But even they would admit that really they don't. It's the planners, it's the building inspector. And actually, when you look at these new housing estates, there are lots of examples about where you can put your window, how big a picture your roof is. I've never seen one that mentions the word human habitation. So the way we see it going, apart from the commercial aspect of actually selling these beautiful things for people who just want to change their lives, um, is actually just sort of preaching the point that really we can't go on building houses. In, in the UK, we have about 12% of glazing in a house. Uh, and then we cram all the houses together. So even with your, your, your glazing, you're probably not getting much light through it. And our houses are, are really dark. And actually, the, the message needs to get through that if you're building houses for people to live in and be healthy, you've got to put in more glass. Probably 40, 50% of it has got to be some way of getting daylight, natural light into it. Because it's not just the natural light, it's your connection with the, the environment. You know, it's not we don't all live in obviously wonderful places like Niagara Falls, but if you can see it's raining or it's snowing or there's a storm coming, that's what your 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 biology, your physiology is telling you important information. If you can't see it, you're blind to all that. And that's great because so these can almost act as um, yeah. It's this is probably a bad um, analogy, but. Um, I don't know, they're like an extreme example. So even if we just bring like an extra 10 or 20% more glass and light into our residential spaces, then we're already like, we're already well down the way. So these can be almost extreme example of 100% glass. Yeah. But yeah. Um, oh, that's brilliant. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, obviously for research, 100% daylight uh, had, to be, had to be the way, the way to go. Um, so yeah, exactly right. You're saying, you know, this is an extreme case. It's almost like a glass tent. You know, I mean, some people say I hate camping, but actually, camping in a nice climate is lovely um, because of all the, all the other things about it, about the the connection with the environment and the daylight. So actually, it's a luxurious glass tent, you could say. Uh, so it's an extreme case, just to show people that one, this is entirely possible. So anything below 100% is even easier. Mm. You know, well, let's really make an effort and make uh, make our lives better for everyone. You know. I love it. Thank you. Uh, and now just a couple of questions to finish off. We ask all our guests uh, this. What does a fulfilled life mean to you? <laughs> um, now I, hope my, I hope my family aren't listening to this. because they'll, <laughs> they'll, they'll probably say I failed. It's, it's funny how you know, your fulfillment is, is sort of takes different stages throughout your life. And I suppose you first of all get a job and your idea is to fulfill yourself by creating a nice environment for your children. And then you sort of grow out of that and you go on to the next stage and you think, oh, okay, I want to take them all on holiday, teach them stuff and all the rest of it. So I suppose to me, actually, fulfillment is having, spending proper time with my family and people who I really care about. As I say, if my children are sitting there, who are actually the age, <laughs> actually the age of your demographic on this show, they're probably saying, Dad, <laughs> you tried hard, but you didn't really do it. But I've now got, I've, I've, uh, we had a grandson, uh, he's now just over a year old, so I'm going to do better with him. <laughs> Round two. <laughs> yeah, it's quite, yeah, yeah. yeah. And what is, uh, what is one thing all our listeners can do today that will have a massive positive effect on their lives? Right. Well, I suppose today they'll have to go and have a watch the sun uh, set. Um, and then tomorrow morning, wake up, watch the sun rise. I mean, it's actually, at this time of year, it's quite a convenient time, you know. Just go and sit there. As I say, it doesn't matter whether you cannot, can't see the sun. It'll make a difference. It really will. And actually just think about living in a more natural way, you know, within your contemporary life that we all have the chaos we are surrounded by. So what's so what's and are there any books or resources which have had a big impact on you? Um, gosh, I don't have time to read books at the moment. But I, I must say I do read The Economist every week of which 80% is filled with misery, you know, <laughs> miserable conditions in other countries, corruption, all the rest of it. And I guess what, I'm, I'm a very positive person, and when I read it, I think, you know what, I can make a little bit of difference in the place that I'm working in, you know. So it, has, it does have an effect, otherwise I wouldn't read it because it's so depressing. <laughs> <laughs> it makes you realise, actually, my life's pretty good, <laughs> oh, yeah, quite, watching yeah. it, all, the, all the rubbish. Yeah. Uh, and finally, um, how can people find out more about you and stay in touch? Should we send them to like your website or 
LinkedIn yeah, do, or where do you like us? Absolutely. Do go, do go on the website and we're going to have a special button for anyone who wants to be an ambassador. That doesn't mean any more than just saying, you know what, just keep me informed. This makes a difference and all the rest of it. And we've had a, a stream of wonderful emails from people who suffer all sorts of things and they tell us their stories about when they used to work in a pub or something and they used to spend a lot more time outdoors. And it's those sort of things. They just make it all worthwhile. Most commercial companies don't get that sort of email. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, thank you so much. Really appreciate you talking to us today. It's been okay. fascinating. And um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, just so we, there we've had the content and, you know, we're going to actually, I'm going to chuck all the videos and some like photos below so you can actually see it with your own eyes because it's a, it's fantastic. It's a fantastic thing you've got going on there. Thank you. Yeah. Talk soon. Right. Thanks so much, Charlie. <laughs> Cheers, Duncan.